My name is Marwan Creedy. I'm honored to be a member of the Center for Arab Islamic Studies. And uh, I'm, I'm really uh, very excited about this conference. Uh, I can speak for uh, everybody on the center in thanking Sylvia and Nasser, especially, and Jessica, for the great work they've done. <clears throat> so um, I'd like to, I have the honor and privilege of introducing the luncheon speaker, my friend, Dr. James Zogby. And uh, as you'll hear tonight, to this afternoon, uh, Dr. Zogby is a man of many talents. But when we say Zogby these days, we're, there are a lot of Zogbys, or at least two Zogbys in the public sphere. We also have Doc, uh, John Zogby, the pollster here. John, would you stand up? From Zogby Polls, you probably know who he is. Has done great uh, uh, opinion research in the Middle East and is currently conducting uh, public uh, opinion research in the Middle East. Uh, John usually gets things right. John, you broke my heart in 2004 your exit polls, I want you to know that. Uh, you had me convinced that George Bush had lost his second straight presidential contest. <laughs> but let's get back to Jim Zogby. <laughs> Jim is a scholar. John, uh, in 1975, Dr. Zogby received his doctorate from Temple University, the Department of uh, Religion, where he studied under the Islamic scholar Dr. Ismail al Faruqi. Uh, he has been a national, uh, received various postdoctoral fellowships at Princeton University from the National Endowment for the Humanities and was awarded various grants uh, from the Mellon Foundation, the National Defense Education Act, etc. He also received a Bachelor of Arts from Le Moyne College and in 1995 was received an honorary doctoral of law degrees, and in 1997 was named the college's outstanding alumnus. In 2007, Temple University College of Liberal Arts named him as its distinguished alum. Dr. Zogby is also an activist. Is the, uh, Jim, as I call him, is the founder and president of the Arab American Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based organization which serves as the political and policy research arm of the Arab American community. Uh, since 1985, Dr. Zogby and AAI have led Arab American efforts to secure political empowerment in the United States. Through voter registration, education, and mobilization, AAI has moved Arab Americans into the mainstream. Um, he has also co-founded numerous other Arab, uh, Arab American organizations, including the Palestinian Human Rights Campaign, Save Lebanon, and was the first executive director of the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee. This is my relationship with Jim. And I've known Jim since the 80s. Jim um, caused me to lose my first job, get fired from a job in 1987. It's another story. Um, but he's done a lot in our area in Philadelphia and has some personal relationships. Dot, Mr. Naima Ayub over there held a fundraiser. And I, and I just want to show you real quickly how Arab Americans have moved from the completely ignored and dispossessed to part of the political mainstream. In 1984 or 87? 84, uh, Naeem held a fundraiser for a, a less than stellar mayor of Philadelphia uh, candidate at the time, Wilson Good, um, whose opponents the next day accused him of taking money from the PLO. Uh, brave uh, Wilson Good returned the Arabic checks. That doesn't happen these days, and I just want you to know that a lot of it's because of the effort Jim's done and guided us as the Arab community. <clears throat> um, a, a good example is the governor of Pennsylvania has appointed at least 10 Arab Americans to positions of responsibility, and thank God for a lot of you giving me a job, so I'm not here knocking on people's doors too much. Um, but Ed Rendell has appointed people, Mayor Nutter has appointed Arab Americans, and you cannot be involved in the American political process in, in several states, Michigan, New Jersey, California, <coughs> California Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, without interacting with the Arab American community. And that's all thanks to Jim and his mobilizing efforts. Jim is active in politics. In 84 and 88, he served as deputy campaign manager and senior advisor to the Jesse Jackson presidential campaign. 1995, DNC chairman Don Fowler appointed Zogby as co-convener of the National Democratic Ethnic Coordinating Committee. 
and re he was re-elected to that position. He was also appointed to the Executive Committee of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, in 2006, he was also named co-chair of the DNC Resolution Committee. Dr. Zogby is also a peacemaker. This is when we thought that peace was possible in the Middle East, prior to eight years ago. In 1993, before uh, he participated in the signing of the Israeli-Palestinian Peace Accord in Washington, he was asked by President Gore to lead uh, Builders for Peace, a private sector initiative to promote U.S. business investment in the West Bank and Gaza. And he also frequently traveled with, President, with Vice President Gore and the late Secretary uh, Ron Brown. Um, he is a communicator. He's a lecturer and scholar in Middle East issues, appearing frequently on television and radio. I'm sure some of you have seen that. Uh, he has appeared as a regular guest on all the major uh, network news programs. Uh, and he has hosted a popular show, a Capital View, on the Arab Network of America from 1993 to 2001. And from 2001 until now, he hosts the award-winning Viewpoint with James Ogby on Abu Dhabi TV, Link TV, Dish Network, and Direct TV. Since 1992, he has written a weekly column on U.S. politics for the major newspapers of the Arab world. His column, Washington Watch, is currently published by 14 Arab and South Asian countries. He has authored a lot of books, I think some of them we have here, but including What Ethnic Americans Really Think and What Arabs Think, Values, Beliefs, and Concerns. So, after all that, you, you, we ask you, why did we bring him here? Well, Jim Zaghi has another passion, and a passion that I think he holds more dear than politics, than Middle East issues, etc., and that's basketball. <laughs> Jim would, is, it's important that here, he's here to see Villanova win tomorrow night, and I'm sure Jim would like to be in uh, Detroit tomorrow to root on Villanova. So, I'd like to invite Jim up here to say a few words. What we're gonna try to do is, um, Jim's gonna talk however he like, long he likes to, and then we'll have a question and answer uh, series. So Jim, please, welcome. <laughs> the longest introduction I've ever gotten. But <laughs> I used to, uh, when I founded the, the Anti-Discrimination Committee with the former Senator Jim Abrisk, uh, uh, we'd go around the country together and uh, uh, I'd come first, I'd speak first and uh, uh, have an introduction read like that. And then he'd get up and they'd say, and now the man that needs no introduction. And I said, I said, shoot, in my life what I want to be is the, the man who needs no introduction. I'm not there yet. Um, but, but thanks for reminding me, Rowan. Uh, the uh, um, uh, I, I of course want to just. Uh, my brother John and his wife Kathy are here, and I'm so, just so glad that they're here. But I wanted to just correct two things about the the story. The Wilson Goodwin was 83, and John was at the event uh, with Naim, um, and it was a pretty painful moment. I never. Never forget the shock that they had. And you're right. I mean, we've come a long way since then. Uh, not quite sure that it's a good thing that they want our money, uh, that they keep calling for the money. But uh, uh, it's a hell of a lot better, I think, in some ways than getting it turned back, which is, is, is always quite painful. Um, I, I thank you for the invitation. I, I noted to Marwan several times that the program simply said lunch with Jim Zogby. He didn't say anything about speaking. Um, so I was hoping to kind of be off the hook and not have to do it. But I did want to share a couple reflections uh, when told that I had to say something. And, and I, I will, I'll do it this way. The, uh, I did get my PhD in Islamic studies and then I did postdoctoral work in religion under stress and did a whole lot of other things with, uh, with my life. And um, maybe the most interesting thing I did though uh, in my academic phase, which was back in the in the 70s, was get a Mellon Foundation grant to conduct a program with six small colleges in South Central Pennsylvania, Franklin Marshall, Dickinson, um, Wilson, Susquehanna, Gettysburg, and I don't know what, Dickinson? I, I already said that? I don't know, six of them anyway. And, and what it was was that there was a, a recognition of the fact that they would not be able to hire a professor of Islamic studies or a professor of Arab history, and they were small colleges, 
But my idea was that they didn't need that professor. I wasn't looking for a job. Um, but what they needed was to augment their existing curriculum to include and round out the role, the contribution that Arab and Islamic history played in each of their many disciplines. And so it was six campuses and it was professors from the religion department and the music department and the French and, and Spanish departments, et cetera, et cetera. And I had an opportunity to meet with them all uh, every other week. I got to bring Dr. Faruqi and his wife, uh, Lamia, who spoke on Islamic aesthetics. She was brilliant, as always. Um, and Edward Said came, and it was, uh, uh, and then we also got a budget as part of the Mellon Foundation grant that covered uh, ordering books for the library, um, books that they did not have. And I, I remembered the importance of that, um, I, I, that the importance of that approach came to me in a, uh, uh, observation made by Sidney Poitier uh, at one point in the early 70s. He, he and Harry Belafonte did a uh, dialogue on PBS on, it was Black History Month. I don't know if you remember that, John. Um, it was really quite striking um, because they were known as actors, but they were incredibly intelligent and, and very thoughtful men. And at one point when asked about black history and what he thought about teaching black history, Sidney Poitier said, it's nice, but it's not what we ought to be seeing as our goal. Our goal is to create a comprehensive human history. And that is what we do not currently have because we, we are teaching a history that has a single focus on white civilization and doesn't see it as an, as an, uh, uh, an interwoven uh, tapestry of many civilizations producing where we are today. Um, what we were trying to do with the, the program that I did that was out of Gettysburg College was actually to do the same kind of thing, to, to sort of provide the correction that it's not that that happened there and this happened here. There was a reason why the Islamic Empire rose and there was a reason why Europe declined and then there was a reason why Europe rose again and the Islamic Empire declined. And in that period, there was a constant interaction. And it wasn't just the Crusades. I remember when I went to grade school, I used to call the textbook from Stone Age Man to Ike. And there didn't seem to be a whole lot of progress there on one level. But, but the, the story began with the Stone Age guys. And they were always the European Stone Age guys. And there were these great carvings in in caves in France, and, and then you went from there to the Greek and Roman empires, and then you went from there to the Dark Ages, and then you went from there to the, the Holy Rome, you know, whatever. You went forward all the way up uh, to modern Europe, and man to us. That was the linear progression. And there was always a mandatory couple paragraphs on China, because they had to get the Great Wall in. It was like a picture that had to be like someplace in the corner on the, on the book. And, and um, and Marco Polo, because, I mean, we obviously got some stuff from there, but it wasn't that they brought it. It wasn't that the Mongols actually were conveyors of civilization westward. It was that one of our guys had to go there and find it and bring it back uh, because, obviously, it was about us. The story was about us. The only place Africa comes in is slavery, and the only place the Arab comes in because they had to get him in some place. There, there was either a picture of a pyramid with a camel guy, and it was a thing about the desert and life in the desert. And for some weird reason, I remember the, 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 the laps were in the book. There was something about laps and reindeers, and, and I'm not quite sure. But it, in other words, it was the irrelevance of Africa, Arab, Asian civilization, and... Um, and the laps, I mean, it was all like one piece. The, the periphery of, of Europe and the central story was, quote unquote, us. That's how most of us were educated, and that was the story we learned. Um, and so when I was here, Temple, and I was studying with not just Ismail Faruqi, but that marvelous department that they had constructed with uh, 
not just, like I said, Ismail Faruqi, but people like Sam Loikley. And we were learning about the impact of Islamic music on Baroque music, or on the French short story, or on the architecture to be sure, and the science to be sure, but, but all of the ways that the civilizations commingled, if you will, producing what we are today. I, I, I thought of Sidney Poitier, and I thought of that as, as I tried to look at what we could do in, in, in small colleges, and, and how to not perpetuate the division by saying, OK, we got to have a professor of, of Middle East studies, but you're not really teaching European history if you're not teaching Islam. You're not really teaching um, uh, modern literature, or modern romance language literature, if you're not talking about the contributions that these stories made to the early development of, uh, of literature in, 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 in Europe, et cetera. And, um, uh, I've seen some of those folks uh, 30 years later, and uh, they they still talk about what, the, the, in particular, um, uh, Mrs. Faruqi and her 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 two lectures that she gave on Islamic aesthetics and how m impacted they were by by what she had to uh, to offer. Um, that was that was my 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 one. Excur my voyage, I guess, into into the academic life. I, I taught for five or six years, and um, and that was the you know one of the, the the moments I enjoyed the most. And then I left and went into the academic uh, into the activist world that you you describe it as, and and it has been a, a long a long ride, um, bringing Arab Americans from the periphery of politics to today, where we actually have a role in in politics, and and um, and and dealing with the consequences, if you will, of the 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 distorted or the 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 single focus history that was the European perspective that we. We, 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 we were taught and that we continue to teach. And the consequences of that being that despite our involvement in the Middle East, and it is, it is uh, of consequence. I mean, I, I used to say that before the Iraq war started, before that war, um, in the two and a half decades from the end of the Vietnam until that war, we had sent more money sent more weapons, lost more lives, uh, and fought more wars, and, and had more interests at stake, and, and, um, and no knowledge of the region at all. I mean, we used to do teach-ins on Vietnam. And, and we, in that period, tried to understand that history and know those people, and try to understand to some degree, at least on the student level, uh, in the student movement, where we were and why we were there and who these people were and what they were about. Um, and we still don't understand the Arab world. I mean, when our kids were walking down the streets of Baghdad, they had no clue how they were being seen and or even what they were seeing. Uh, the notion that uh, flowers in the street and, you know, whatever, I mean, that that, that notion was only able to be projected on the American mind because we had no idea of what we were going into. I mean, I remember arguing against the war in the Democratic Party and trying to get a resolution on it, which was ruled out of order and the, they wouldn't entertain it in the executive committee, uh, saying that the lie is not weapons of mass destruction. The lie is the president hasn't got a clue where we're going or what we're doing. And he hasn't told the American people about what the consequences are and what the terms of commitment of this war are. And how can we fight a war in an area we have no knowledge of whatsoever? That was the lie in this war. And our poor kids were, 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 were caught in the middle of it, walking down the streets of Baghdad thinking they were liberators. And they were not seen as such. And, um, and for all of our investment, for all of our involvement for all of the price we've paid and what we have at stake and at risk, 9-11 happened and we didn't have a clue what was going on. 19 faces, 19 people defined 
Islam and Arabs for most Americans after 9-11. One of the most disturbing things we find in our polls is that when we used to poll back in the 90s, Americans and say, what do you know about Arabs? What do you know about Muslims? What do you know about this? People would say, I don't know a lot. And then we'd say, do you think you need to learn more? Would you like to learn more? And it was in the high 70% said that they do. Now when you poll, it's dropped down to the 50s, the low 50s. Say, I need to learn more. The problem now is that people still don't know anymore, but they think they know more. And the danger, of course, of thinking you know more, I mean, what, you know, bigotry and certainty is a really dangerous brew. And that's what we're stuck with right now, is that, I mean, the, the people like Juan Cole were, were brilliant when called, but were not the people who were called frequently enough to define the turf. I'd do these shows, and after a while, just stop doing the shows because it was way too painful. With and we we have uh, Jim Zabi with the Arab perspective and our regular commentator, and then they'd have their regular commentator on, who, pardon my expression, it was one in our neighbor didn't know his ass from his elbow. I mean, I'd be in the green room with the guy, and he'd be saying, "Yeah, it's real dangerous out there." The colonel, something. If you had a colonel before your name. You were like a, a military expert. And military expert meant that they called you. You had fought in nowhere, right? You'd been like a quartermaster someplace. And, and you were now on Fox News as their military expert. Let's talk about Afghanistan. Let's move over to Iraq. Well, tell us about the Egyptian military. Didn't have a clue what he was talking about. This poor guy on CNN, Jacobs, the guy they got, not a clue what he's talking about. But he's the expert. And I, I wrote an article once called The Experts Who Aren't, and they've done an incredible damage, d job damaging America's understanding of all of this. I mean, it is a huge problem. The problem we have today is not just that they don't understand us, it's that we don't understand them and are making mistakes every day based on what we don't understand. And um, anyway, I was in the green room with this guy, and he was saying, yeah, i got a real problem over there in Iraq. It's like first little warning sign you get. Iraq, and uh, they got a. They, yeah, he said that those Iranians they keep sending money over there, and they're 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 arming that that army, and we're going to have to be fighting both of them because they're going to gang up together against us. Well, that's one of the consequences of this war. But back when the war was starting, that was certainly not the case, and Colonel whatever his name was didn't quite know the difference between Iran and Iraq and the fact that they had actually fought a war. Uh, against each other and had no, not only we're not going to team up against us, um, but we're, we're, you know, Iran was going to kind of wait until the corpse was ready to go in for the picking, um, and that's kind of where we are right now. But the issue is, um, uh, is a dangerous one. That became, television became the venue for education, not the university. Um, and when television became the source of education, what we were given was not only not adequate, but also dangerous. And so it has shaped views about Islam and shaped views about the Arab world. Um, and coupled with the fact that we had an administration, half of TV news is, it comes from what is administration policy. Not that the president says, this is what you report, but reporters are lazy. And, and, and a, a story is the president said. So president gives a dumb speech, it gets replayed over and over and commentated, commented on um, by, by, by television uh, smart people who, oh yes, the president really put his finger on the pulse of that one, uh, the caliphate. And what's this about the caliphate? Well, the caliphate is a Wikipedia has done more damage to our, our knowledge base than, than, than anything. And, um, I got called one time by, by Fox News. The, the woman said, we want you to come on and talk about Afghanistan. I said, I don't know Afghanistan. And she left. She said, nobody ever says that to us. <laughs> they always say, oh, sure. Oh, what time do you want me there? And then they go run to Wikipedia or go to the newspaper and see what the headlines were for the day and then fudge it. Um, but the Zogby rule is you don't talk about something you don't know about. Um, and I, I stick to that. But it is, it is, a, it is a problem. And so I, I think that the task in front of us is, is an enormous one. It, it's, it's one whereby we, we have to round out our history. We have to imbue it with a fuller sense of the contribution that other civilizations have made to it, not only to do justice to them, but to do justice to us, to understand from whence we come 
and to whom we owe a debt for all of what we uh, are, are living with today. But secondly, we have a policy set of, of, uh, of, of, of issues that we have to deal with that require our understanding. Um, it is, it, it, in some ways, not exaggerated to say it's a life and death issue of how we deal with and understand Iraq, how we deal with and understand uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue and Middle East history and in general. Um, and so that we do not get sold uh, again a, a bill of goods and that we know how deep the hole is and what we need to do to get out of it. And I guess, I, I just let me close by saying that I have some real confidence in the ability of our president um, to work, work us through this. Um, one of the more interesting little comments that Obama made in his Arabia interview uh, were not his comments about you know, uh, the, you know, the policy issues and things he was going to do, but at one point he said that as president, he said, my task is to, and he didn't take the usual public diplomacy line of say, is to communicate who we are to the Arab world. He said, my job as president is to communicate to the American people about Islam and what it is and what it means and to communicate to the Muslim world uh, as well. And he understood, in other words, that there was a two-way interaction there that American leadership had a responsibility to engage in. Um, and so I, I think that he, he is somebody who, who gets the need to know um, and not to walk into these situations blinded by ideology or, or, uh, or the, the sheer desire to impose one's will without understanding the consequences of, of, of action in a certain area. And, um, and my steps they've taken already and, and people they've put in place make me somewhat confident that, confident that we are in a better situation today than, uh, than we have been in a long time and in a, at a moment in history where we need to be in a better situation uh, than we've ever been because the dangers are as great as I think uh, you know that they are. Um, so I'm just going to end there with some of those comments to start and I'll take some questions and we can talk for a while. friend of mine, the mayor of Nazareth, back then he wanted to make t-shirts that said, save the Palestinian whales. He said, we, we need to have, uh, uh, create a campaign around our whale population. It was a way of getting attention. But I, I, I mean, I, I think I, you're right about the fact that, we, no, 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 the, the media is controlled, yes, but not by the people you think it's controlled by. It, it's actually controlled by other interests. It's commercial interests that view they are convinced that what they're doing is working and building their audience base and giving the audience what they want. But obviously something's not working because they're not getting the audience that they thought they were getting. I mean, I, I'm not, I am not convinced 
that there isn't a market for, for, for BBC uh, or for a really solid news program because, I, I mean, I can't be alone in waking up in the morning and, and flipping as quickly as I can from the morons on CNN to the double morons on Fox to the really annoying but at least remotely smart people on MSNBC in the morning, um, except a couple of people there who are just really annoying. But it, it, I mean, the conversation has become so remarkably banal on these shows and or, I mean, you have O'Reilly and Oberman and I might agree with Keith Oberman, but frankly, that's not giving me news and it's not giving me information and helping me form an opinion. And so I, I, I it is not controlled by an interest, it's controlled by what they feel is their economic interests and or, and the other part of the problem with media is a different kind of control that operates, and that is that I live in that little ghetto in Northwest Washington where at my church, um, Chris Matthews and Mark Shields and uh, Bill Bennett and Teddy Kennedy and Pat Buchanan and Bob Novak and they all go ch to church there and Cokie Roberts and whatever. They're all there. They're in the same circle and and it becomes a you know the, the, the adversarial role that the press needs to have with government is gone in this little world in which they live because number one you socialize with the guys I mean, Ed Markey is there. I mean, I, I, I only gave you the media part, not the, the political part. But they're all in, in the same neighborhood. And they all go to the same black tie dinners. And they all go to the same parties. And, and so in some way, the same way that kind of a, like an, an Arab journalist in a more totalitarian setting would say, I can't ask the king the question because I'll be banished from the, 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 the palace. These guys are always afraid of being banished from the palace as well. You don't want to ask the tough question of the president. You won't get called on at the next press conference. Or you'll be shunned by senators such and such. Or you won't be invited back to the next gridiron dinner because you're an embarrassment. And so with, you know, given the ground rules that operate, it's the same thing. And, and so there are so many restraints on press freedom in the states. And when the interest defined is don't rock the boat. We're going to war in Iraq. So MSNBC has the little countdown to war, which I thought when I turned on one morning, I said, oh my god, it's colder than I thought it was. I thought it was the temperature thing in the corner, but it wasn't. It was like 23 hours to war. I mean, how goddamn sick is that? And yet that's how they operate right now. And so it, there is the problem of misinforming and just not informing all at the same time. It's a, and it's a big problem. Hey, Jim, I know you've been uh, toiling in the Arab American vineyards for the last 35 years at least. And when I look back at what has happened in that span of time, you know, I see all these wars that took place, how many more Lebanese are dead, how many more Palestinians are dead, how many uh, homes have been destroyed, how much land they have lost, the jailing wall that's built, the Iraqis uh, by the millions are suffering. And I say to myself, you know, where's the progress in the last 35 years? What, what's your point, Rep? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to, uh, I, uh, to be the squeaky wheel mm. here, but how do you keep going? I mean, when, when will we turn the my brother calls it a growth industry. Uh, what I do, he said, it's 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 good. You'll never be out of work. Um, yes, no, never mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and people always want and people always want numbers. Um, no, um, it, it look, uh, Raph. I, number one, I didn't make those wars happen and couldn't stop them. Um, and but I don't hold that as the metric. Of that I'd use to, to measure um, success or failure. I, I, I can't. Um, it was interests and powers bigger than me and that I could ever be that led us into those uh, fiascos. I mean, the, the, the guys who wanted that Iraq war were, were not consulting us uh, about it. What 
I had to do, and I, I looked at my work and what Naeem and John's experience in 83 was, um, as not so much changing American policy, but creating the conditions whereby my community became full participants in the society, period. Um, and there is an upside to that. Um, upside is, yeah, we don't get our money given back, but we also have the opportunity today to, to get posts in government that we deserve and that we had not been in a position to, to get before. And they're not always positions in the Middle East policy making, but our network and our ability to use that network um, can help guys get, uh, Marwan wants to be on the, 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 the what's it called? Merit system. The Merit System Protection Board in, in, in Washington. We're working hard to get that done. We've got a couple people in, uh, in assistant secretary roles right now. We've got people getting on boards and commissions and people getting positions at the White House who deserve them in the legal counsel's office and Justice Department in civil rights, et cetera. We had not been able ever to do that before. Uh, I mean, I can tell you back when the anti-Arab thing started, I mean, I had trouble getting teaching jobs. I mean, I finally ended up at Shippensburg. I don't wish that on anybody, actually. Um, and, and it was just because somebody died. Actually, the letter, I should have known better. The letter announced, it said, due to the death of a colleague, we're pleased to announce an opening. That was like, warning bells should have gone off then, but I was just, like, I needed work. I was working at McDonald's here in Philly, and, and I had a child and another one on the way. I went out there, and the first thing they told me was, now you understand you can't do anything on the Middle East because it's a little controversial to have you here. That they had a Jewish guy teaching Middle East and a British woman teaching Middle East. That wasn't controversial. The third piece of that puzzle was the Arab guys and our, our side was controversial. But, that was, and then later on they came to me with the, you know, could, do you think you could get some money for us? That was the other side of the Arab thing. You were either a problem or you were a source of money, which w was pure bigotry is what it amounted to. But that's not where we are right now. And I, look, I care about Palestine and I care about Lebanon and I care about Iraq. And, and more than it all, I care about America and what we're doing to ourselves and to our children and to our future. But I care about my community's right to participate as full citizens in this republic. Uh, and, and that is what we have tried to secure. And, and yeah, we want to be part of the debate and part of the discussion on these issues, and we are, more so today than we were then. We have not been able to win those debates, but we have been able to at least be involved in them. That may not be victory, but that is progress, and I feel proud of the fact that we've gotten where we've gotten. Um, so it's a, it's a tough, long road to hoe, but we've We've made some progress in it. And we're recognized as a community, and we weren't 30 years ago. Uh, Dr. Duffy, I have two questions. Go ahead. One is about, uh, and after the president, new president, are the Democrats a little bit better or not better or significantly better? Because I remember two years ago, I think, the Kuwait World World, the way yeah. they were given the contracts. You have Peter King, you're Republican congressman, you have Chuck Schumer, Democrat. Uh, close it down. Yeah. So I was wondering, are they going to be any better? That's number one question. Second is, uh, if you would highlight just two major changes that you would have to undertake if you were doing surveys in the Middle East, uh, generating that confidence uh, in the minds of the citizens so that they would give you normal responses uh, to the critical questions. That they I, let me tell you, start with the first part. You know, it, it's interesting that in all the polling we do on critical Middle East issues, there is a clear partisan split. They're like, it's like the red state, blue state split. You ask the question, how do you feel about, you know, Israeli, Palestinian, you know, do you support it, uh, you know, whatever. And, and, and it'll be like 50-50, but on the Democratic side, it'll be like, you know, 65-35, and on the Republican side, it'll be 35-65. 
there is a partisan split. And partly because of the influence of neoconservatism and, and more the influence of the religious right. The Republican Party in its base vote has gone over to the dark side on most of these questions, whereas on the Democratic side, their base vote being African American and Latino and, and, and progressives, um, uh, they're largely going to be you know, almost near two to one, uh, supportive of Palestinians, wanting the president to put pressure on Israel, opposed to settlements, etc. That's just the way the numbers look. Now, does it make a difference when you have a Democrat in the White House? Well, I think it does when you have this Democrat in the White House. And I think he's already changed some of the political uh, discourse. Let me, let me tell you, the, the first time I, I met Barack Obama, um, the first time I met him, um, he, he started talking to me about the, the need to change our political discourse on the Middle East. Um, he said the problem is that You've got one side screaming at the other side and nobody trying to find out where the common ground center is. He said, we need to raise a moral voice that challenges people on the issues um, in a way that resonates with where, where, you know, where our values are. And um, for me, a politician who started the discussion that way was a whole lot better than I don't, I, you know, I'm really with you guys, you know, but uh, I, I can't do it because, you know, the, the Jews. You know, that's this kind of crap we get in Washington, Raph. You know, that's the stuff you get from politicians. Is I call it call it a club. I say it's the I'm really with you guys butt club, and it's politicians who are basically anti-Semites, um, but they want to pretend to you that they're pro-Arab, and that's not how the that's not how the, di the, the 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 thing breaks for me. It's not like, you know, they're not impressing me with the you know you know how the Jews are. That not only doesn't impress me, it really turns me off. Um, and so they will talk that way to us in private, and then they vote on the most horrendous stuff. Um, and Obama's different. I, I can also tell you that the, the I, I was doing some work with him on a trip he took to the Middle East during the Dubai ports thing, and um, he uh, uh, had just come back, and he wanted to give me a report back on the visit um, and what he had seen and you know what he had done, and. Um, he walks in and the first thing he says, he said, I'm so ashamed of my party for what they're doing on Dubai. He said, I will not say a word. I will not join this cabal. Uh, I think it's wrong and, uh, and I, I won't be a part of it. And um, it was bipartisan. It was a bipartisan cabal. You're right. I mean, it, with the Democrats sort of using it because Chuck Schumer thought it was a lever against the president on national security and then Republicans trying to outdo them one and Bush looking weak in the middle and Dubai foolishly thinking that they had the support of the president, that's all they needed, and their 15 PR companies here in Washington that were advising them, telling them, lay low, don't, 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 don't raise your head up in this one. So they ultimately rendered themselves, they neutered themselves and were defenseless. Bush, at that point, couldn't have saved his mom if she were in trouble. And, um, and Democrats and Republicans trying to outdo each other to, to beat up on, on Dubai as a national security threat, it was a done, it was done. Um, but it was, it was bipartisan and, and, I, and, and Obama was different. Now, will he change the tone? I think that he, he's going to ultimately, as long as he stays strong enough and popular enough and is able to move his agenda on other issues, I think that there will be people who will be supporting him on initiatives he takes on the Middle East. Remember, I mean, look, the, the appointment of, of Dennis Ross alone, uh, of not appointing Dennis Ross, uh, and the appointment of George Mitchell alone was a real setback. I mean, WINEP, the Washington Institute, that is the, the sort of the APEC funded think tank. It's their same donors, actually. Some of their people left the APEC board and went over to WINEP and peeled some staff away and founded it. The Washington Institute, they issued a press release saying Dennis Ross got the job. Uh, they don't do that stuff loosely. They thought they were driving the story. And it sat there for a couple weeks and went nowhere. And then oh, Obama announces uh, after the inauguration uh, at a grand ceremony at the, at the, uh, the State Department, uh, George Mitchell and... Uh, uh, and, and, and Holbrook, 
and uh, no Dennis Ross, and then three more weeks go by and still no Dennis Ross, and then Hillary, nine o'clock at night, uh, appoints Dennis Ross um, to the State Department job on Iran. But even now, um, Holbrook is carrying part of the Iran portfolio. So I, I'm, nobody's quite sure what he's doing or if he's doing anything at all. But the point is, is that o Obama set in a different tone and he's not, not playing by the, the, the rules I think that the other guys want him to play by. And so I'll wait and see where this goes, but my sense is, is that it's, it, uh, it's, it's going to be a whole lot better than some people are expecting it to be. We actually did. What we did was uh, John uh, and I uh, did a poll called what, and we we called what Arabs think, uh, and we actually polled in uh, eight countries, Arabs in eight countries. Uh, we did uh, tons of briefings uh, at the State Department and with uh, Central Intelligence people and uh, um, with think tanks. We sold a bunch of copies, gave out a bunch of copies, um, and. Uh, and it, it penetrated. I think it penetrated and um, a lot of folks there continue to use it and continue to work with us in follow-up polling that we do um, because if you want to know what Arabs think and you want to understand the Arab mind, the best thing to do, we say, is talk to them. And what polling does is provide an opportunity to let 3,000, 4,000 people across the Arab world talk back at you. Uh, and give you answers, and the, and the results are surprising. Now, there are some who won't listen. I, I tell the story in something I wrote about um, Liz Cheney. Um, I got called to do one briefing, and it was with all the people from uh, the intelligence community and the State Department and White House National Security Council, and she sat like the queen at the end of the table. Um, Summoned, uh, I didn't realize, I thought I was doing a briefing for the whole group, but it turned out that it was a command performance before her, me and it was uh, uh, Andy Kohut from uh, Pew. Um, and it was weird, it was weird. I, I, I presented my results and um, uh, when I finished, one person asked me from, uh, from the State Department, he said, what were some of the interesting things, some of the different things? You told us what you found, but what are some of the more sort of off the track stuff you found that you didn't expect? Um, surprises in your poll. And uh, I said, well, one in particular I thought was very interesting, and that was in Saudi Arabia. We found that on the issue of women's rights, that men are more inclined to support women having their rights than women are. Women in the kingdom, historically, we find more traditional on these issues than men. Well, this Cheney says, that's not true. <laughs> I had four women in my office yesterday, uh, Saudi women, and they are definitely not going to agree with that. I said, yeah, that's probably true. And they were four who were in, you know, we had 800 women that we talked to, and, and uh, you know, I kind of, but, you know, this, this idea of, Finding people who become your echo and using it to validate what you is is something that this administration was classic in in that's what they did, um, and so if you spoke there, I, I was invited early on to a meeting with Condoleezza Rice, a meeting that was it. When you disagreed, you were no longer talked to. So, okay, we got. A couple minutes left, I was told we have to get you out of here at a certain time. So what I'm going to do is those people, I have at least two or three who are going to ask questions. Why don't you all ask one question, we're going to put it together, and Jim's a smart guy, and he'll try to put three answers together. <laughs> Him being funny. I just want to uh, uh, address this question of uh, multi multiculturalism in the light of Obama's election, and the fact that, in a sense, but your multiculturalism is the only way to move forward with uh, uh, democratization in, in, in the United States. 
it could also degenerate into a ghettoization and the fact that say that uh, two African two African Americans held prominent positions in the Bush administration didn't in any way help African Americans or Americans in general. In fact, it undermined everybody's interest. Or that General Abu Zaid was was uh, uh, in charge of the criminal enterprise. But but also, what's the name of the church? You, you I, I want to join that congregation. We have a couple of questions and short ones in a row. Thank you, Mohammed Katjaou from Hashemite University from Jordan. I want to ask you about the role of uh, Arab people in America, especially uh, like you, Yitz, like you, like uh, Professor Saad Ibrahim, to speak about uh, Arab issues and Muslim issues in the uh, United States of America. Thank you. Who else? Well, Got the middle one, the second one uh, about Arab Americans. You talked about Arab Americans in the, the role of Arab Americans in. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, one of these issues of the, the multicultural issue is is one that intrigues me because I chair the ethnic council in the Democratic Party, and it's 19 ethnic communities. Um, that are the have historically were the cornerstone of the party when when we were growing up. I mean, it was the you know it was the Irish, the Polish, the the Italian, the the urban ethnic Democrats were the were the were the party, um, and the party sort of moved in a different direction and lost them. And we're trying to sort of re-engage the role of those communities in the Democratic Party. And so I, I do a lot of work with ethnics, generally speaking, and. Um, and have written about this whole issue of engaging diverse communities in, in America. Um, I believe that there is a fundamental difference in the American um, experience. Um, we're not Europe. Third generation Pakistani kid growing up in, uh, in, in London is still is a Paki. And you can be four generations in, um, in Germany and, and a Kurd, but you're still a Turk. Um, and within a generation, you become an American, and even before that. And you don't just get a passport, but you get an identity, and you get a value system, and you get a, 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 a notion where General Abizade is a four-star general in the US Army. He takes the orders of his commander in chief, and he executes them. Um, he's not the Arab general. He's the four-star general who happens to be of Arab descent. And um, that is both the greatness of who we are, it's also the, the kind of the wonder of who we are, is how that identity um, has over so many generations and such an enormous cultural mix survived. Um, one of the things that I get concerned about is, I, I, I remember, you know, one of the, the in, when, when you talk about, it, I mean, we grew up in upstate New York and there were Revolutionary War battles and, you know, and it was the burned over district and that was our history. Um, it happened well before my father had come here. Lebanon's history stopped being my history. New York history became my history. U.S. labor history became my brother's history and his passion. Civil rights became our issue. Um, we are American. I was in a cab one time in New York um, on my way to something, and um, the father was saying, oh, Dr. Zogby, we love you, and you're this, and you're and saying to his son, who's eight years old, this is the man who fights for us. And I'm proud of that, that he feels that way, you know, and that he sees me as the guy who champions him on television. But the whole time he's doing that, 
his little boy is saying, oh, look, Dad, at pointing out the, can we go to that movie? Shrek, it was just, you know, and, and can we see, oh, look, they're putting up a stage here. There's going to be some stars. They were at Times Square. I was doing the Reuters studio. And I said, that's it, you know. I mean, if you go to Riyadh today and you're in the mall, and the kids got jeans on and Iverson jerseys and New York Yankee baseball hats a little askew. I mean, that's globalization. And they're sitting at Pizza Hut or they're going to McDonald's or they're at, you know, whatever. I mean, that's globalization. It works here too. I mean, it has taken successive generations of immigrant kids and made us American. We, we, we love our heritage. We respect our traditions. We, we, we feel comfortable identifying today with them in a way that back when we were growing up, we weren't always comfortable with it. You know, mom would speak Arabic as the threat. You know, I'm gonna get you, you know, whatever. And, and I'd say, oh, geez, she's doing it now. Everybody's gonna know I'm weird and foreign. But that is not the case anymore. I, I think that there are some new pressures today that threaten to break that up, but I'm fairly confident that we, we survive it, that the power of the absorptive nature of the American identity ultimately trumps the, 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 the fragmentation. And, and Obama is the perfect example of that. And, and, and Michelle, too. I mean, they, they are African Americans proud? Uh, of course they are. But I remember saying something after the election when John McCain said, it's a great victory today. Our African Americans must be proud. I said, yeah, you're part right. I mean, all Americans are proud. I mean, we've made a statement about who we are as a people um, that is remarkable. And, uh, and I, you know, when I hear her compared in London to Princess Di, I say, wow, that's, that, for them to say that, that's saying something about that we're helping them get over some hurdles. Because I'm sure that, I mean, no, I mean, I remember saying at one point during the election, I looked at the polls and I said, you know, 80% of Brits and, you know, 80-something percent of Germans wanted Obama to be elected president. And I said, wow, if you were born, if your daddy was from Kenya and you had the middle name Hussein, don't even think about running in Germany for, for the, the president of, of the, 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 the country, you know? I mean, they get what we've done. Now it's time for them to start cleaning up their act with their Kurds and their Turks and their Pakistanis, and et cetera, and feel that they too can develop a, a broader sense of who they are. Uh, is there going to be a change in the, the Saudi-US uh, relationship? I, I don't think so. I mean, there was a one-on-one -on -one with the king and, 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 and Obama. Um, uh, there was a time during the campaign when both candidates were making some really dumb noises about uh, um, ending our dependence on Mideast and Venezuelan oil. I mean, as if it like comes out of the ground with a different genetic component than, than oil from the good oil, white, white people's oil or something. Um, I, I, um, I'm not sure that that, uh, that that was, I mean, McCain and Obama both said that in the same debate, I remember. and. Uh, uh, we're beyond that now. It's it's a uh, it's a it's a different rhetoric, and I I think a a it was important that on his very first day in office, he called uh, Abu Mazen, and he called Mubarak, and he called King Abdullah, and he called uh, uh, the other King Abdullah, and he called uh, Omer, four Arab leaders, and the Israeli in the first day, and he has continued a contact with Saudi Arabia and with other countries in the Gulf. The notion being here that we will, yes, we'll, you know, we're gonna outreach to, I mean, Syria, we're gonna outreach to Iran, but we're not gonna walk over our friends on the way there. I mean, you've paid a price, you've worked with America. Um, I, one of the things I have uh, against this last administration is they not only gave uh, peace a bad word, they gave democracy a, a bad name. Uh, you know, they made both of them. I was in Jordan when, um, Condoleezza Rice in 2005 gave what was the weirdest speech on earth. She's in Jordan. We had just finished a poll. U.S. favorable ratings in Jordan were five. And, uh, and she gets up and she starts her talk with, in the last 60 years, our foreign policy has been based on a, on a fundamental uh, mistaken notion. And, and, and we've been in error. And there was like a gasp in the room. And it was like, oh my God, the Arab is really, she's going to say that we've been on the wrong, you know. And she said, we've supported the kings and the dictators against the people. 
And I said, you're in Jordan, you know? And, and, um, and this guy, this king, has paid a price for his friendship with you. And he is hated now, if he's hated at all, because he's a friend of yours. And you come here and undercut him in the name of democracy. I mean, how stupid is that? The point, in other words, is that do I want democracy? Of course I do. Do I want human rights? Absolutely. But you do not royal a region and screw it up as much as you possibly can, ignoring what they need and creating problems that are bigger than they ever had, and turn people against you and against anybody who's been close to you and say, okay, now let's have democracy. Because what you do then is you, what you get is not results that reflect the will of people, but reflect the distorted will of a people in fury and in fear over their lives having been disrupted. And it's a, it was a horrible, horrible uh, administration on so many levels. I mean, they, they gave peace a bad name, they gave democracy a bad name, they gave America a bad name, and we're still paying a price for it. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.